Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu syafil anbiya mursalin wa ala alihi washabbi ajmain la haula wala quwwata illa billah. Uh, Brother Abdul Wahid uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Tan Sri Kamal Hasan uh, uh, Professor Shukran Professor Osman Baka uh, my old colleague Uh, old means not old age lah. <laughs> Asma Ismail, uh, uh, Brother uh, Abdul Aziz, uh, thank you very much for SDG 18. I'm still mulling over it. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. I feel very humble each time we have got a, a seminar or webinar. I'm called in and I'm very happy to participate because I'm looking at an opportunity to learn. Uh, certainly some of the topics that you put in is beyond my uh, comprehension as 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 the one that is today when you talk about the philosophy i'm not a philosophical guy at all i'm just a plain street scientist not even at the level of asthma uh, but still i want to participate because i want to learn and there's a lot of opportunity uh, to learn uh, in iium for the last three years So I'm going to be brief and and talk about something that I know very little. Hopefully that it makes uh, sense to you. Uh, in the context that when I joined uh, USM uh, in the 1970s, uh, the word interdisciplinary is already there. USM started under the tutelage of uh, the late Professor Hamza Sindut, uh, introduced interdisciplinary from day one. For example, I'm a science student. 70% of my courses will be from the sciences and 30% will be from the non-sciences, including religion, but uh, USM is not a, such a religious uh, university. Therefore, it is just one of the many uh, electives, so to speak. Yeah? For those people who take the arts, will have to take 70% of their courses in, the, in the, the arts and 30% in the non-arts, in the sciences, applied sciences, and so on and so forth. In that sense, I think USM is also an integrated uh, university. In fact, the whole university was integrated, not just a whole faculty, but the whole university is integrated. Everybody has to do this uh, 30%, 70% kind of uh, uh, ratio that I was talking to you about. So I learned a little bit about the social sciences uh, from this uh, sort of uh, culture that is brought. And I also begin to learn a lot more in terms of interdisciplinary studies, particularly when I read the book by Edward Wilson called A Consilence that talks about, he says about the fragmentation of knowledge, he says is the, artifice, is the artifacts of intellectual uh, endeavors. He said knowledge has never been fragmented like this. And you can to narrow and narrower and narrower uh, to quote uh, people like uh, Edward, uh, what do you call Edward Di Bono. He says, we are actually digging a hole deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. In other words, going into depth. That at the end of the day, when we, when we arrive at the end of the hole, we do not know where we started. In fact, we don't even see where we started. And therefore, we lost the whole idea of what knowledge is all about in an integrated way. And that's why he introduced this whole idea of uh, lateral thinking and so on and so forth, just to bring back the knowledge uh, together as a kind of a unitary uh, body of knowledge rather than being compartmentalized uh, the way it is. So when I joined the, the, the university, uh, my search was basically what are the other non-science knowledge that I need to know? And because in the, the university at that particular time was very new and the learning of interdisciplinary was also very new, the people who teach us has never had this interdisciplinary training anyway. So I got many of my interdisciplinary training from the NGOs outside, the likes of CAPS, uh, Consumers Association of Penang, uh, the likes of uh, 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 what do you call uh, Sahabat Alam. You know, these are people who have already practiced interdisciplinarity uh, and I use the word practice rather than just teaching it in the classroom and therefore I'm very excited to listen to Professor Shukran that the new imperative is to bring a community oriented uh, uh, knowledge as it were and focusing into what the future is all about I think this is a very progressive way of looking at things and I hope that your Kulia will be able to influence other Kulia to also do this in a kind of a practical way rather than just talking about it 
and we have never had any experience uh, in the on the ground because what matters at the end of the day is what happened on the ground, not just what happened in our brain. I think academics just think what happens in their brain, but they do not know what's happening on the ground. And sometimes they do not even know how to react when they see things are happening on the ground. So I want to take this into a kind of a specific case that I'm familiar with, and I think the university also is familiar with, so that we can demonstrate this question of reality and the future as far as interdisciplinary is concerned. So I'm going to pick something that some of you know uh, that is on the sustainable development as a cause of moving forward. Hopefully, it would help a little bit of what Shukran is trying to do in trying to contextualize sustainable development as a future orientation, given the Islamic philosophy with it. And I'm going to leave the Islamic philosophy to the uh, best known people like Osman Baka, who knows philosophy better than I do. And I hope what I'm saying could be integrated into the bigger picture of the Islamic philosophy, so to speak. So I will start with the, with a with a lot of caveat, uh, I, I stand to be corrected, but I'm going to share what I know anyway. Uh, after all, this is an academic discourse. Uh, if I'm wrong, just say I'm wrong, and we will then try to put it back into the proper perspective. Okay, let me start by, by uh, God. When you want to start, it doesn't start. Uh, see. Let me start by acknowledging that we are now in a different age. We are now in the age of biology, we are seeing, I think for the last three or decades or so, a shift, a small shift from what we call a mechanical system, uh, an industrial system, uh, so to speak, to an organic system that is a living system, from a dead system that has no soul and has no life, to a system that is living, organic, and this is what we are trying to do when we say it in the age of biology. So at one time, we have physics, chemistry, all those informatics and so on and so forth. Right now, we just add the word bio in front and you'll get what you call the new system as, as it were. So you've got biophysics, biochemistry, bioinformatics, biotechnology, biocomputing. You can put the bio in front and if you can defend it and there you are, you're already shifting into what we call the new things. I think this is very, 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 very... Uh, uh, apparent to me, when you look at the computer system, uh, all the things in the computer system use some, so, some sort of a, a bio sort of marker. Yeah? You have motherboard. I, why, I was wondering why it is not something is a motherboard. You have a mouse. You have thumb drive. You, know? you have worms. All these are biological things that is now infused into this technical system called the computer system. And that system is the one that now is shaping the world around us. But if we don't understand what the system is all about from the, account, from the organic dimension, you're going to lose the whole, uh, the whole picture. Now, just two days ago, uh, is another, this is just June 6th coming for MRIT from, from Australia that talks about a, a letter written by Albert Einstein discussing the links between physics and biology. This is seven decades ago. In other words, what we are discovering today is nothing new in the context of what knowledge was and the way we have compartmentalized it, fragmented it, and, and therefore making it sometimes meaningless because it, we lose the whole context. Yeah? And he's talking about uh, Einstein thinking of the birds and the bees and physics and whether the new physics principle could come from studying animal senses, could come from the environment, could come from the nature itself. And this, I think, which is something new. In other words, how do you integrate this together in a kind of a trans uh, interdisciplinary uh, way? But by the way, I think uh, the, the more uh, up-to-date word is a transdisciplinary rather than just interdisciplinary. There's a slight difference between the two, but transdisciplinary, I think, is a better way to describe it. So you have books like this, Insectronics, yeah? a combination of insect and electronics. Now you see people are you looking at insects. A popular one is to look at a cockroach. How do you make uh, an electronics like a cockroach so that it can go under the smallest sort of space? And for, for example, like the massive destruction uh, in, in Florida, you cannot go into the crevices, then you use these insectronics to go and find what is there so that they can so tell us whether there's still life caught under this. These are a good combination of what biology and physics is all about. And our inspiration 
comes from nature, our inspiration come from what has got created us and the kind of a model that we need to follow. Yeah? We have got amphibionics, yeah? learning about what you know, this uh, reptilian is all about, how do you replicate this so that they can live in two worlds and so on and so forth. And of course, now we talk about robotics at the same time, new, using neuromechanics and motor control. Neuro is from the word nerves and nerves are basically what is a network is all about. It's even called neural networks, eh? trying to emulate the brain and therefore you have work like STEM uh, actually telling us what this artificial intelligence is all about. The word intelligence is a biological word and then it is made into something which is mechanical using this binary and so on and so forth. So I, I want to just bring back this whole story that if you just live in physics and biology without putting this dimension together, you'll probably lose the whole plot. And certainly, if you can add the Islamic values into it, putting it another dimension of spirituality, then I think you probably can make this whole thing work together as a kind of a convergence of knowledge, which is what I think this university or at least IRK is trying to do. Yeah? And finally, we will then get uh, uh, another piece uh, of, uh, of uh, art uh, or science in that sense. Uh, you don't know which is a professor and you don't know which one is a robot. It looks almost the same, and I think this is where the world is going into. Yet, when we talk about this robot, we will ask, where's the soul, where's the conscience, where's the intuition, and so on and so forth, when we try to put this together in a package of what knowledge ought to be in the, in the 21st century and beyond, and so on and so forth. Right? So, if you look at the shift, you begin to understand what the shift was, when you talk about the Indra Silk Age, I still go back to the Indra Silk Age as the age that actually changed everything in terms of knowledge. Yeah? Everything must, you, you use a, man, a mechanical sort of uh, a metaphor. Uh, the brain is seen as a computer. Everything else is a clock uh, because that's what you see. We see simplicity is also a, millennia, a linear thing. All is top down. Uh, everything comes from outside and then we try to you know, uh, put it within us. And then everything is externally assembled. It is made by somebody else. It is owned some by somebody else. And therefore, the whole view becomes very, very mechanical, right? And where are we moving? We are moving into an organic thing, which is almost diametrically opposite. You talk about information age, now knowledge age, and even wisdom age. People are beginning to talk about it. We are no longer talking about just a clockwork. We're going to call the whole, whole nature, the ecological dimension, which is more complicated. Than, and then, then the clock. It is not a linear thing. It is a very complex thing. The whole, a whole discipline of study called complexity is now being being studied uh, away uh, in 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 abroad. I think we should bring the study of complexity also here to understand what it's all about. It is no longer bottom uh, top down. The rector is no longer important. What is coming up from the bottom is more important than what the what the rector has to say. Right? It is an inside-out process. It is self-organizing. If you want to use the, uh, your, your, the word that we all often hear, uh, it is self-Islamizing in a way. Yeah? It is not made. It is grown. It is organic. You don't own it. It, is, it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all need to look after it the way we look things the best we could. And it is all in a very naturalistic sort of uh, nature, which I like to look at in the kind of a garden of knowledge and virtue and the way it is. So you can see the shift and how the shift is going to be very, very different and what are the kind of operational sort of uh, framework we're going to use, whether we're going to use the organic one or we're going to use the mechanical one. Sad to say, our education system is still very much the mechanical, uh, out-of-date out sort of model that we need to shift so they become very fluid. And that's why we talk about stuff. We talk about stuff in the context of empowerment, empowerment flexibility. We talk about innovation in a, in, in a very organic way. And we talk about accountability. We are, not, we are leaving this mechanical idea behind because the organic idea is more important as we move forward, inshallah. So if I were to draw uh, this diagram, I think uh, the, the whole idea is a pyramidal thing that we human beings stay on top and the rest is below us, uh, which is kind of egocentric in a way, uh, because it is very rigid, 
It is all about me. And I think this is what we, we understand in the word of silos. I come first, everybody comes second. We compete with one another like hell. And sometimes, you know, to, to no end, we talk about ranking, we talk about league table. And I don't know who wins at the end of the day. And the people who rank, uh, who, who, who runs this ranking thing wins. We are all becomes the pawn of these rankers. They take the money and we just take the debris from what has left. It is almost a debt system. Pyramid, a pyramid is almost a dead system because it is a very stable system that do not have any life at all. And that's why the pharaohs are put under them. So we, we talk about an egocentric system. No, it doesn't work now. Okay. And now we need to change the system. We want to get an, 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 an organic system. It has to be living to start off with. In other words, like I say, it's top, bottom, uh, bottoms up. Everybody, everything needs to be networked. We are interrelated with one another. You know, there's no central point. We are interrelated with one another. We are flexible. It's all about us. It's not about me. And therefore, collaboration is the word. And it is a living structure that needs to be created. So that at the end of the day, it is a kind of a, you know, a, a system that all of us can relate to rather than a pyramid which is stable and it is dead in that particular sense. Yeah. So how do you make this shift is something that we need to do because everything around us is collapsing. Beginning from the economy, I think Wahid mentioned some of the titles that we talk about. Yeah, the economy, the ecology, uh, the geopolitical structures, and even the social structures are all breaking up. And COVID is telling us this, whether we like it or not, it is right in front of our eyes. It's a matter of whether we are aware or we're conscious about what we want. And this is again because the way we take it as a kind of a, 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 a kind of a mechanical way, trying to fix it. You know, at the end of the day, this model does not work anymore and we need to shift into a new model. And this is where I think the transdisciplinary idea becomes a viable idea moving forward. Yeah. So we have, we have to find a kind of a balance and the meaning in the many things that we do. The words that we use must have meaning. It is not just a word that to be bended around with empty or hollow meaning. We need to find the depth of the meaning. Maybe this is where the philosophy is. Maybe this is where I think we need to find our place in the world. And finally, I think to have an agenda where the community comes first because they are the people that actually serves the world as such. And therefore, we need to get in touch with them. In the words of the United Nations or the other bodies that I work with, it is called the post-15 agenda. Where do you move on after the post-2015 and what is the agenda moving forward? And this is where the idea of where we are becomes an issue. Yeah, moving forward, we don't own anything anymore. We rent it. And we used it and then we returned it. I think this bicycle that we see in our campus is meant to be like that. Nobody owns this bicycle. You rent it, you used it, and you returned it. Yeah? Equipments are also like that. Nobody buys equipments anymore. Asma should be able to tell you this better. We rent it, we used it, they repair it, and we don't want it, we returned it. And then we rent it again. So in other words, the, the ownership, the whole idea of ownership is no longer an important issue when we move forward. We don't own anything anymore. We need to share it. And sharing, therefore, needs to what we have, what we were talking uh, lately on this whole question of cultural intelligence. How do you share with people of different dimensions, people from different uh, walk of life, people of different kind of values? How do you share? And this is where the mission number six in IUM is a very important mission. We talk about inter intercultural dialogue, understanding, mission number seven, deep sense of responsibility, which I think needs to be articulated further when you talk about this interdisciplinary thing. The rest are important, but I think number five, number six, and number seven is equally important if you were to live in the world that is no ownership, that people work together, and they are, big, they are beginning to, to use the word sharing. I think sharing is now uh, seems to be the word uh, that we use of often, and that also demarcate whether we are actually together in trying to make things work rather than just sharing uh, for the sake of sharing, but not sharing the values and the meaning uh, at the same time. Yeah, They've been trying to do this using the Millennium Development Goal, and then you have the Sustainable Development Goal. It has its own uh, what you call weaknesses, but the whole idea was how to get people to share, how to create a more equitable environment, how to put just 
justice at the central piece of everything that we do. And this has to be done uh, through, through education, right? And hence the word trusteeship yeah, uh, becomes an important word. I think just uh, last year, there is this Earth Trustee Forum, which is again sponsored by uh, UNESCO. It is uh, 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 held in Bangkok. And this word trusteeship, depending on where, who you talk to, has different meaning to different people as far as uh, sustainable development is concerned. It could be guardianship, it could be custody, it could be care, it could be trust, it could be you know, protection, custodian, and so on and so forth. So depending on the context and the culture where you come from, I think this whole idea of sharing becomes the main, the main agenda. I would like to bring this into another word, just to compete with the so-called 5G that we've got today. Uh, we are going to have very soon, inshallah, on the 2nd of July, uh, a webinar called The Boons and the Bins of, of 5Gs. Yeah? When we have now 4Gs and people will talk about 5G, I've already seen discussion on 6G. Now, all these Gs things will, will stay with us and the younger generation will understand this very much. But I want to give just a counter a counter. Uh, idea of what this 5G is about, given the COVID environment, and this is how I'm going to explain it. Yeah? Under the COVID environment, the mechanical 5Gs are not good enough because we need, it has no meaning, has no, uh, what you call, uh, uh, in-depth idea of what this 5G is all about. So I would like to interpret it when you talk about 5G, the first G is about giving. When you talk about sharing, it's about giving. Giving what? Giving what is grounded, giving what is the best that you can. You don't give what is, what is unwanted for you to other people. Here, when you want to talk about the COVID environment, this is where I think the whole crux of it. What do you give to the people around you who are not having what they're supposed to have? It's a real problem now when they don't have any food, when they don't have no place to live, when they don't have any you know, uh, people to talk to, how do you give? How do you make sure that they are a quote-unquote a dignified human being? Incidentally, I want to share you a good news. You remember this kamp Kampung Pinggiran uh, that we were working with? Uh, probably some of you know there's a couple who is seven months pregnant and uh, who is living in the jungle. We somehow or rather managed to give them a housing temporarily in the campus. Alhamdulillah, last night she gave birth to a baby girl in our campus. Mm. I'm very proud to see that all the people around it gather to help them. There's an ambulance who take the who took her and the baby to uh, to 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 HKL. They are now in HKL. Mother and and daughter are well taken care. I just cannot imagine if we do don't take this couple into our campus, they will probably be given birth in the in the midst uh, night of the jungle. And that's what giving is all about. How much do we give? How much can we give on a grounded level the values that we have, which is, I think, God conscious? How much of this can be put in when we talk about this interdisciplinary uh, thing that we begin to exchange some of this between two human beings who are dignified and be grateful about it? And then a kind of a gratitude that explains what my 5G is all about. And therefore, we talk about a human-centered sort of system where all the values gathered it. And where does it gather? It gathers, of course, within us so that this could be a way of, like I say, moving outside, inside out. We channel it to the world so that we can coexist regardless of what religion, what race, what location. We can coexist as a human being the way we should, inshallah in the context of Rahmatan Lil Alamin. So, so when I go back to the case of a sustainable development, this is where actually where I come from. You know, looking at what the people is all about, where do we stay in the same planet, and what do we do? Unfortunately, the word profit is the word that actually takes the kick as far as the sharing is concerned. And this is where I think we need to make amends when we talk about this uh, coming together of this knowledge base that we talked about. Yeah? Sustainability, as I mentioned, is the outcome. It can be taken in very various contexts. And certainly, our, again, our mission number two in university talks of sustainable development. That probably is a context that we talked about, right? But the reality is not a fair distribution. As I've mentioned, profit becomes the bigger chunk of the three things that is supposed to be shared. 
people and planet are there. It comes to give and take. If you need to destroy the planet to create profit, we do. If we need to kill people, we also do. I think when we talk about the cultural intelligence the last time, we talk about how the native Indians uh, in Canada uh, has been, you know, quote unquote, abused. And I think they are now discovering mass graves. The last one last week, they, they, they saw another seven, 700 mass graves uh, found. And while people are trying to make profit and are trying to benefit from people who is actually the native, the native of the land. Yeah. But this is what I call the Mickey Mouse model. Yeah. The two ears of the Mickey Mouse is, is smaller than the face. And the Mickey Mouse is now a kind of a model that everybody looks up to, at least from the metaphor point of view. Right. Talk to, to, talk to our children about Mickey Mouse. They probably know Mickey Mouse better than they know us. Yeah. And Mickey Mouse has sort of made herself or, or himself very, very adorable with the kind of fashion that we see uh, around us. So in other words, this model of Mickey Mouse is everywhere. They can be a king, they can be, uh, you know, uh, 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 what you call a uh, uh, bandmaster, it can be anything, you know. It's um, the model that we are beginning to appreciate as what the, the values is. So in other words, profitability becomes the main model as far as education is concerned. And hence, we talk about employment, employability, and so on and so forth. Let me just take this a, li a little bit into, in a, in, into a kind of a, a juxtaposition and say, all this, I think, is fashioned by another form of industry. The industry that looks at creativity uh, in a kind of a fashionable way. And here is, I think, the, the, the stark data for us. This, this industry alone is worth 2.5 trillion, yeah? And it affects so many people around the world as far as clothing is concerned. And 80% 80, 80 of the, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, women are involved in this industry. Yeah? Nothing wrong with that, except that if you look at how it is actually uh, used at the end of the day, 85% of the textile end up in the landfill. And you now begin to understand why there are so many people using this, uh, selling this textile around the, around the, around the, around the, uh, the, the what do you call it, the, the, the mall. You go to the mall and, and you can count how many shops selling this textile. At the end of the day, it's about 21 billion tons of textile being thrown away. And yet there are many people who have no clothes around the world, right? And this irony of things that's happening around us, and not only that, this industry, I think 20% becomes uh, with you, waste of water and 10% gives to, uh, to, to, to carbon emission and so on and so forth, right? Now, if you were to look deeper into an industry like this, this is where I'm trying to justify what the profit means to us, when we talk about the three uh, part of planet, people, and profit, you begin to see another sort of a, a picture. What are the negative impacts? You find the depletion of resources, the climate change we've talked about, this animal suffering when they test some of these things, yeah? water pollution when they use artificial dyes, uh, food insecurity when they start to cut trees uh, to make uh, materials for textiles sometimes, air pollution, habitat destruction, and human right abuses, especially in places like Bangladesh, Pakistan, many of the Muslim countries where people are forced to work as a labor to just to produce textile for the industry and so on and so forth, right? Now, looking at this is where I want to introduce this whole idea of transdisciplinarity, a quality or a fact of involving or drawing two or more branches of knowledge. In other words, if you were to look at the apparel industry, the fashion industry, if you want to put it right, there's no one discipline can do that. There are many disciplines that to come because of the negative impact that you can see here. This is probably just a tip of the iceberg. There are a lot more that you can think of when you talk about big brand names, yeah? the Gucci, the Christian Dior, whatever it is. Uh, everybody wants to carry this. But when you carry this, you're also carrying a symbol of destruction of the earth, if not the humankind. And yet, you know, uh, Louis Vuitton, I was told recently, boleh buka dekat KLCC, but the small hawkers are not because it's a lockdown. And this is a kind of unfairness 
that we need. And we only need to do this and to solve this if we know the understanding of knowledge in totality rather than one of its kind, the way we see it today. Just very quickly to show you again, yeah, uh, how do uh, 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 Donald Duck and, and, and Mickey Mouse have benefited from this? Just before the COVID environment, you see 2012, 70 billion sort of profit that they make out of this, selling whatever that needs to be sold, right? But again, when, when COVID environment comes in, you begin to see the statistics changes, all right? Uh, the parks and experience are losing, uh, the studio entertainment are losing, but yet they have managed to manage to do this on online, uh, direct consumer international. And these are the things that I think we need to come and understand when we talk about uh, the interdisciplinary thing. It is not just about what it is, but how this thing operates, what is the mechanism, how do we actually do this in a process of trying to be what they are not supposed to be in the context of sustainable and sustainable development. So where is the future now? Yeah, The future to me is basically to go back into what we call the disciplines. For example, when you talk about the people, what are the disciplines that we need? And these are, the seven, these are the some of the sustainable development goals that we need to, to work on. We need to work on the question of education, number four. We need to work on the question of uh, health, which is number three. We need to work on the question of uh, what you call uh, of hunger, right? You need to work on the question of how do you manage water system. You need to work on the question of gender justice. All these, I think, are the discipline that needs to just tackle the issue of people. We cannot just work on education without ignoring the rest of it and exactly what I think uh, uh, Shukran was trying to say. All right? If you want to mend the issue of profit, what is it that we need to work? We need to work on the number 12, which is about decent work. Yeah? Number 16, about peace and strong institution, which is based on justice. It, we need to work on community which is sustainable and so on and so forth. And we want to work on the planet. There are other disciplines that we want to work on. And this way, I think the interdisciplinary idea comes to. And that's why we say we cannot work in silos anymore. We need to work together because there's so many things that needs to come in before you can even arrive at a solution. What is a solution is to bring back dignity to human life. And I'm again, using the words of our mission, we talk about quality of human life and civilization. And that's goal number one. We should talk about no poverty, that people can live a dignified life because they don't have to beg or they have to be, you know, uh, what you call uh, uh, looking for sympathy of others. At the end of the day, uh, the number 17 is, of course, the uh, working together in partnership. And Alhamdulillah, uh, if Prof Aziz and team worked it well, we'll have and have another one, Sustainable Development Goal 18. We talk about spirituality that cuts across everything else. And that, to my mind, for the time being, is what I call the five Gs. Yeah, And this is where the spirituality comes in, hopefully, when we manage to work the five Gs alone. So at the end of the day, when we talk about transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary is about the human life. It is not about journal publication. It is not about being famous. It is not about all the things that we've been told. It is about at the end of the day, how do we impact the life of others so that they can also have a meaningful life at the same time? You know, we are not living uh, at their expense because we do research, we use them. At the end of the day, we become famous and they remain the way they are. That is not what I meant when we talk about interdisciplinary in this particular context. Yeah? You can see, again see, if you don't work on the systems well, when the, when the COVID comes in, all the negative impacts will be seen. From number one, number two, number three, number four, all these things that is important in terms of the discipline that we need to contribute, will collapse. And it is collapsing one by one. Number three is collapsing if we cannot maintain the way it is, is maintained today. Yeah, which is uh, the health system. The education is also collapsing because with the closure of schools and so on and so forth, we find that a lot more people having problems than they have than they should have in the context of the, the negative. So you need to look at this is in, in this particular context, how at the end of the day, this could be sustained and this can only be sustained if we work together. 
He cannot stay on his own and becomes a kind of a contribution in terms of solution. I think this is quite clear. Not everything in the negative, somehow or rather the planet is in a positive. Again, a lesson to be learned. The moment we lock ourselves down, and that's why sometimes I think it's a blessing that the planet can breathe again. People like us do not have to manibu all the time. Yeah, that the breathe that the, the the planet breathe again. Let the animals uh, come out to play. You know they have been hiding all the way because we have been dominating their their padang all the time. I remember uh, the padang near my house. Uh, the wild boar used to run there. Now they put fence around it. The wild boar cannot run around anymore. Uh, I don't know what the wild boar is going to do. They probably will end up in the rector's house because there's no fence there. Uh, but these are the things that we need to think about. Yeah, what are the balance of this? When we know this is something that we need to look at at the end of the day, when we talk about transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary, the performance of uh, Walt Disney, uh, given the COVID, it is quite stark. Yeah, I'm not an economist, but it tells me this is not the rosy picture that I showed you earlier on 2019. It is 2020, and I'm sure by the year 2021, this will be even worse. Than it is today, so let me come back to what is this 5G. The 5G to me is a value system that you nurture within yourself, so that at the end of the day, like the other mechanical 5G, it will reverberate from you. It comes from us, the inside out, rather than from a mechanical instrument that has no meaning to us. That sometimes make our life even more troublesome because we are out of control altogether. And how do you fully fuse this in the context of interdisciplinary? And the question I'm going to put forward to you: You are better people to understand than I do. But I do understand. I do want hope that it is us in control rather than the machines or the mechanical system in in control. After all, we are now supposedly to be in this bio biological or organic system that we think it is more conducive to us. I would want just to, to to quote this 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 gentleman here because he's one of those guys who invent many of the things that sometimes make our life difficult. Yeah, but he has his own point. He said a lot of people in our industry, it is his industry, haven't had very diverse experience. And I want to underline the word experience. We in the academics has very little experience, and I sometimes look at at it uh, a bit liu. Yeah? When he talks about he talks about his own experience, how he helped people around him. Us in the academics, we don't have that experience. We can talk about our own uh, writings. We can talk about the conferences we go, but that is not about people. It's still about us, right? And that experience is if so important because they say they don't have enough dots to connect. All right, and they end up in a very linear solution. Without broader perspectives of the problem, indeed, when we talk about interdisciplinary, we are talking about the broader perspective of the problem. Something that I do not know as a science student, but if I have to take an arts paper, it broadens my knowledge. If you're a religious person, you learn about science; it broadens your perspective. If you're a science, if you're an arts student, you learn about science; it broadens your perspective, and therefore you can move out of this very linear solution that we've been subjected to for for a long time. The broader one understanding of the human experience, the better design you will have. In other words, the better solution that we have. Yeah, and I I kind of believe this. I think we must broaden our perspective in terms of experience. Moving out, dirty our hand, sweat it out, learn from other people, and that will be the kind of knowledge that we need, so that it becomes a practical knowledge that we can bring to bear to other people as we work on. Right? I would like to finish with with a simple metaphor. If you don't have a perspective, if you don't have enough experience, when somebody talks to you about an iceberg. The only thing that you can imagine is two cubes of ice in a glass, because you have not heard of iceberg before, you have not seen, you have not, you don't even want to know about it, and your world become that small glass with these two ice cubes. How do you then go on to solve uh, to solve problems that other people are facing, because you do not have the perspective, and therefore we need to move out of our classroom. And this is what the 
community orientation is all about. The classroom is not the final place that we will die in. We will die in a community and we must know the community better so that we can help them better in the context of education, inshallah. Right? So what is connecting the dots? This is a small experiment if you want to do it, I think. You need to connect all the nine dots with four straight lines without lift, lifting up your pen or a pencil and if you can do it within two, two minutes, you are there. Uh, otherwise, you will take a whole day, in fact, a whole lifetime to solve this. Right? If you don't have the perspective on how to connect the dots. Because most of us will try to work. Okay, thank you. Uh, you all try to work within the square. And if you look at ourselves, there are so many squares in our, in, 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 in our place. Yeah? Our room is a square. Our table is a square. Everything else around us is a square. And we think the square is the only solution that we've got. And therefore, our mindset is built on that. And therefore, when you try to solve this, we forget that we can move out of this square. And this is where the future is. I would like to end up by just showing this. You need to go out of the square. And then you can connect the dot. You see, you go out of the limits. In other words, if you have got this knowledge, you must, must move out of that limits to find where the solution is. If you stay within that knowledge alone, you probably will find it, or maybe it take a longer time, or maybe you cannot find the at all, depending on what sort of knowledge are you uh, begging on, right? So I would like to end, and this is what sometimes we call innovation. I am more interested in social innovation rather than technical innovation. I think we have enough technical innovation. We do not have enough social innovation where the thinking process comes into bear rather than just producing things that we know uh, the way the engineers are working today. Right. So when we talk about disciplines, this is what it is. There are three disciplines. It could be, you know, engineering, it could be medical, it, it could be religious knowledge or whatever. It is. They are all disjointed. And this is what is meant by, by the linear solution by uh, Steve Jobs. Yeah? When you need to connect this, you cannot connect this because you're confined with that silos that you created for yourself. And I've mentioned to you just now, if you want to talk about interdisciplinarity, this is where it is. Yeah? A unified knowledge that gives you this connectivity into a kind of a comprehensive, and as you go into this, you'll find deeper meaning of things that you need to do. It is not just at a superficial level, it has better meaning. The moment, the moment you connect with other people, you begin to learn, and your knowledge becomes more substantive in the kind of finding solution. And this is where I think we will go back to where we were, and some of the post-2015 and beyond, we need to do the sharing, and the sharing is what I think uh, the basis of this uh, interdisciplinarity, and hopefully this will be the foundation that we will build, uh, the new knowledge moving forward, adding, of course, the philosophy that is very much required on this. So on that note, let me stop and thank you very much for your kind attention. If I make some mistakes, I apologize for it. I'm uh, here to learn, and inshallah, let's learn together. So wabilahi taufiq wa hidayah, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh.